Good morning. My name's Amber Strawn. I'm an astrophysicist at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. And today's program is coming from the museum right here in our nation's capital. So tomorrow we get to say happy birthday to a cosmic celebration 25 years in the making. But before that, we need to share an important gift for that celebration to you and everyone around the world. So before we begin unwrapping that gift, I want to first acknowledge some very special guests in our audience, some uh, astronaut heroes that are a key reason we can celebrate 25 years of Hubble being in space. In addition to the two Hubble astronauts on stage, there are a few more in our audience here. Would you all please stand and be recognized? And now would you all join me in welcoming NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden. Thanks very much, Amber, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming out this morning. It, it's great to be here with you. It, it's really great to be with you because um, I was surprised to see my former commander, Lauren Shriver, walk through the door, and uh, that makes it really, really, really special. Uh, I want to say a special word of thanks to our host here, uh, the museum and to everyone here who is a part of a shining light of the magic of Hubble, the People's Telescope. I was in Colorado last week and, and I told folks with whom I met that uh, this Hubble anniversary is really bittersweet for me. Uh, it's bitter because 25 years is a long time and, and, and I hate admitting that I'm that mature. Well, not mature, just plain old old. It's sweet because of all that Hubble has allowed humanity to see and learn over this past quarter century. I had the honor of being part of the crew that deployed Hubble in 1990, and I'll let you in on a little secret. I had the easy job. I was assigned as the pilot of that mission, and uh, contrary to what most of you think, that's actually in NASA speak for co-pilot. So it means I kind of lurk around and watch everybody else do their stuff. Lauren Shriver, who I just, just mentioned, was our commander, and he had the responsibility of maneuvering discovery throughout the deploy evolutions. Dr. Steve Hawley, uh, who we used to call Dr. Stevie, uh, was, the, was the one with his hands on the controls of the remote manipulator system, or the RMS. He was tasked with getting the telescope out of the payload bay of the space shuttle Discovery and released at the appropriate time. Dr. Kathy Sullivan and Bruce McCandless had been suited up for a possible contingency spacewalk or an EVA when we had some initial problems with the deployment of the Hubble Solar Arrays. While I'd love to tell you that whole story, uh, we're on a tight clock here and so I won't. Catch me, you know, as we walk around after this or catch Lauren and we'll compare notes as to whether or not I really remember what happened that day. Suffice it to say, that our colleagues at the Goddard Space Flight Center came up with an ingenious 11th hour solution from the ground. And a quarter of a century later, the rest is history. During the run up to the mission, I got the sense that all of us, in, in fact, Lauren, Steve, Kathy, Bruce, and I, we all sensed somehow that Hubble was gonna be something special. What we didn't realize was how special it really was gonna be. Frankly, we never even thought that the telescope would last this long. The original plan for Hubble, we were told, was maybe 15 years. The fact that we're still going strong a quarter century later is thanks to the Hubble heroes, some of whom we introduced to you a little bit earlier, many of whom you will never see or never know. The scientists, the engineers, and the astronauts who flew five missions to service Hubble in space. Even the most optimistic person to whom you could have spoken back in 1990 couldn't have predicted the degree to which Hubble would rewrite our astrophysics and planetary science textbooks. A quarter century later, Hubble has fundamentally changed our human understanding of our universe and our place in it. Every year, Hubble science data, processes, data processing generates 10 terabytes of new data and discovery. That's enough data to fill the entire collection of the Library of Congress and each and every year. 
The telescope continues to provide us with the intellectual foundation for future robotic and human expeditions, including our journey to Mars. All things considered, I think it's fair to say that Hubble is one of the most influential and important scientific instruments and achievements ever devised. I think that a piece by Tracy Watson in USA Today's fantastic special edition about Hubble sums it up well. She writes that, quote, it's likely that no other modern day scientific instrument has stirred as many passions as the Hubble Space Telescope. Before Hubble, few of us had any notion about the cosmos, how the cosmos looked. Now, we all know pinwheel of stars, gauzy pillars of gas and dust, bright galaxies scattered across the dark backdrop, end quote. As Frank Sinatra used to sing, the best is yet to come. Thanks to the last servicing mission in 2009, Hubble is expected to continue to provide valuable data until 2020 and beyond. With two and a half decades of historic trailblazing science already accomplished, we've come to realize and expect that there is still much more out there to discover. Five years ago, President Obama laid out a vision for space exploration at the Kennedy Space Center. As part of his vision, he called for NASA to build on Hubble's legacy with an advanced telescope that will allow us to peer deeper into the universe than ever before. And many of you will remember, that's the James Webb Space Telescope on which we had already embarked, but we were having trouble. Uh, and it was questionable as to whether we were gonna even be able to do it. In 2018, we'll do just that when we launch the James Webb Space Telescope. It will be placed in orbit about a million miles from Earth, and it will allow us to observe the most distant objects in the universe and to see unexplored planets around distant stars. It will shed light on the birth of galaxies and expand our search for undiscovered planets beyond our solar system. I leave you today, however, with some words from Edwin Powell Hubble, the telescope's namesake. He said that, and I quote, the history of astronomy is a history of receding horizons, unquote. Hubble has played a critical role in shrinking the horizon of our universe. Today, we are on the threshold of sending humans farther into the solar system than ever before. And thanks to Hubble, our vision is now farther than ever imagined possible. I'm now gonna invite the chief Hubble handyman, our Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, Dr. John Grunsfeld, to come up for our special unveiling uh, that we're gonna do for you here in about five minutes. But John, please come up and join me and give us a little of your recollections of your time with Hubble. Thank you. Well, I'm really thrilled to be here today for the 25th anniversary unveiling of Hubble's uh, what I hope you will all find spectacular anniversary image. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm thrilled to be here is because, you know, with my fellow astronauts, once we service the telescope or launch the telescope, there's always a question, you know, will it work? Um, and you all know it works, and that's why we're here. Otherwise, we'd all be in exile in co countries like Bolivia or elsewhere. Uh, so just happy to be here. NASA's science and, and NASA at large, our, our mission is to innovate, explore, discover, and inspire. And there's no better characterization of that than the imagery and the science that comes from the Hubble Space Telescope. We would never be able to be here talking about Hubble 25 years after its spectacular launch if it wasn't for the innovative ideas and engineering that went into the tools, into the new scientific instruments. The reason why Hubble is making such great discoveries today is that we've been able to use the remarkable space shuttle to put new instruments in, to take advantage of new detectors. I see a lot of digital cameras out here. I see a lot of smartphones. The detectors in those cameras, the CCDs, the CMOS detectors, were developed by pushing the frontiers of astronomy and specifically the Hubble Space Telescope. When we explore, we look out into the cosmos. And that's exactly what Hubble has done. It has shown us an amazing story of the history of the universe. It has literally unraveled the mysteries of the universe, especially with the new detectors and cameras that we put on on this last mission. When we explore, we discover things. 
Hubble was designed to discover a few specific things. It was to determine how fast the universe was expanding, prove the existence of black holes, and look at where you know, stars were forming and dying. Many of the discoveries, in fact, most of the discoveries from Hubble were things we never expected. Uh, things like the origin of gamma ray bursts, the most energetic explosions in the universe other than the, the origin of the universe itself. Uh, that every galaxy has a massive, supermassive black hole in its center, including our own. And amazingly, that the theory of the origin of the universe and the expanding universe, the evolution of stars and galaxies and planets and us, is a story that we've been able to unfold for almost the entire 13.72 billion year history of the universe. And in fact, even that age is something that Hubble determined. And it wasn't sh sure that it would be able to do that when we launched it. We've known about the expanding universe for, well, since Hubble's time. And there are a lot of ideas about what, what is our future. In fact, science is trying to ask questions about where did we come from? Where are we going? And one that is particularly interesting to me and many people is, are we alone in the universe? Uh, Hubble has shown us where we've come from. And remarkably, it's now told us where we're going. And it's not what we expected. The universe is expanding. We expected it to be slowing down. But in fact, it's speeding up. It's accelerating. And that's uh, caused astronomers to invent a new term called dark energy, which really means we don't know anything about it. Um, but it's this mysterious force that's causing the universe to expand. When we launched Hubble, we knew about nine planets in the, in the universe. Uh, then we were demoted to eight planets. And I have to remind you that on July 14th, the Pluto New Horizons spacecraft will zip by Pluto, uh, dwarf planet, give us our first view of the Pluto system. It's going to be very exciting. We'll have another celebration for that, I'm sure. Uh, but after those eight planets, suddenly uh, the Kepler Space Telescope ground-based observatory started discovering hundreds and thousands of planets out in the cosmos, in our galaxy. Hubble was able to look at the atmosphere of a planet around a nearby star, something that nobody ever imagined an Earth-based telescope or an Earth-orbiting telescope could do. Really incredibly exciting. But this day almost didn't happen for numerous reasons. The Hubble story itself is a story about people overcoming extraordinary challenges. Uh, and one of the challenges was the misshapen mirror that was discovered after launch. And in fact, all of NASA was at risk, whether we could fix it or not. Uh, then in 1999, all of the gyros failed on Hubble, and we had to go up and fix it, kind of a rescue mission. And then in 2002, we had this problem with the power on Hubble, and we had to go up and, and do something that nobody had ever anticipated. Uh, I love being in space. I'm really happy in space. I wish I was up with the crew on the International Space Station right now. You know, not a one-year mission. I'd go up. I'd like to live in space. But there was one moment in space that I really wasn't very happy. And that was in 2009 May, just six years ago, when we went up to put the new Super Duper digital camera into the Hubble Space Telescope. And the image you're going to see today was taken with that digital camera. Uh, and when we went to take the old camera out, it was stuck. The bolt to remove it wouldn't turn. And uh, I wasn't smiling then uh, at all. In fact, I was very concerned uh, that we were going to break the telescope and that the old camera would never come out and that we'd done all of this work, including a cancellation of the Hubble mission itself uh, after the tragic loss of Columbia. But we were up there. We had the tools. We had the people. And uh, fortunately, we got that camera out, put the new one in. And ever since then, Hubble has indeed been unraveling the mysteries of the universe. So in just under a minute, Charlie and I are going to virtually unveil uh, this spectacular image. Uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about what kind of image should we show. And of course, I thought, well, we should have a new picture of Mars. Ah, we have lots of pictures of Mars. And we have a fleet of spacecraft exploring Mars today. And that's our destiny. Uh, NASA is, is exploring Mars preparing for sending humans to Mars. Well, in the end, we came up with a really spectacular image. Hubble imaged it. It was even better than we thought. Uh, there's a team here that helps prepare these images from the Space Telescope Science Institute. Jennifer's going to tell you more about the science uh, for that image. Um, but I think you'll all find it really compelling. It's something that we do when we celebrate. And uh, is that 10 or? Nine. Are you oh, ready, Charlie? Okay, I, I've got this side. You take that side. Let's 
grab we'll the, watch the virtual screen. Here we go. Let's pull. Go. This is uh, the exciting name of Westerland 2, but this is a gaggle of young stars embedded in their star-forming cloud watching fireworks in a star cluster of very bright young stars uh, celebrating Hubble's 25th anniversary. Now, the fact that it's taken thousands of years for the light to get to us just means that they planned really far in advance. Um, but this spectacular image shows a cloud of dense gas and dust. The gas is collapsing, forming new stars. Jennifer will tell you much more about it. But this image is one that you know, numerous times over we didn't get uh, because of the struggles with the technical part of Hubble and struggles of people on the ground and the tens of thousands of people at NASA, at our NASA contractors, scientists, engineers, people who support our space shuttle mission, our NASA mission, our science mission, all coming together around a common purpose to try and understand how the universe works and where our place in the universe is. And this has had just extraordinary uh, reach, not only into the scientific community, of course, and rewriting the science textbooks and our understanding, uh, but into schools around America, and in fact, around the world. Hubble inspires the world. And with that, I'd like to invite Jennifer Weissman to come up. And she's uh, the Hubble project scientist at the Goddard Space Flight Center to tell you a little bit more about the science in this wonderful image. Thank you very much. I turned away from on her iPad, so. Okay, it's a little exercise and uh, freewheeling. This is really an exciting week for astronomers and people who love astronomy all over the world because as we celebrate Hubble's 25th anniversary, we're celebrating some of the forefront science and the forefront discoveries we've made about the universe through all those years and hopefully for years to come. This is an example of one of these spectacular images that uh, we can get with Hubble. The image that we're looking at is a giant cluster of stars in the GUM-29 interstellar cloud nebula in this region of the sky we call Carina. It's a very vigorous breeding ground for new stars. It's about 20,000 light years away from us as we look toward the center of our own galaxy. And the central cluster here is about 10 light years across. There's about 3,000 stars in that central cluster. And they're very young. This is a really new birthplace of stars. The, the, the cluster is only about 2 million years old, which in stellar terms is very young. Uh, and it contains some of the galaxy's hottest, brightest and most massive stars that we know of. So it's a very vigorous star-forming region. What's great about Hubble's sharp resolution is that we can differentiate star from star even in crowded regions like this cluster. So this helps us scientifically to be able to understand what kinds of stars are in this cluster, how they're different from one another, how the population may have formed in the first place. We can study the characteristics because of Hubble's uh, exquisite uh, sensitivity and resolution. What's also great about Hubble is that we can look at regions like this in multiple colors or wavelengths of light, and that gives us a lot of information. The visible light filters that we used in this image were from the advanced camera for surveys, and it's showing us light not only from the stars, but also from this colorful emission and the ionized gas surrounding the stars, that little moon-shaped uh, cloud trough. In these colors, the red is representing a lot of emission from hydrogen gas. The blues and greens are coming from oxygen. All of this is telling us that those bright, vigorous stars in the core are having an impact on the surrounding gas around them. Both the light and the stellar winds coming off the stars are impacting that surrounding material, those surrounding clouds. They're chiseling into them, and they're also ion the, the light is ionizing the gas, which creates these spectacular colors. When astronomers see these lit up nebulae, we say, aha, 
that's a region of active star formation, and this region is truly very, very active. Also in this image, we have data from the infrared uh, channel on the Wide Field Camera 3. This is the spectacular camera that was installed by astronauts, thank you very much, on this uh, last servicing mission in 2009. And with this new capability, we can actually see into some of the dusty veils that might have otherwise uh, enshrouded some of the stars that we can actually see. So if you look around this picture, you'll see some reddish colored stars. Those are stars that might have been invisible were it not for the infrared capabilities of the Wide Field Camera 3. We can also see a whole lot of stars, both in the center and embedded in that surrounding gas. That embedded region of star formation is really important as well, because regions like this tell us that star formation is active and ongoing. The big massive stars form first, that's what's happening in that central cluster, but all that activity, all that radiation and the wind activity from those central stars is impacting the surrounding gas, and that actually incites subsequent star formation in those dense clouds. So as we peer into those clouds, we see evidence of younger stars still on their way to forming, kind of the subsequent wave of star formation. With future telescopes, in particular the James Webb Space Telescope, we'll be able to peer better into those dense dark clouds and see young protostars as they form. We're so excited about seeing the activity like this, and I think that's one thing that Hubble has revealed to us all along, is that our universe is active, it's not stagnant. Things are going on in our own solar system, star formation in regions like this all around our galaxy and other galaxies, and we also see activity going on in, in so many other galaxies. So uh, we're very appreciative of Hubble this week, and I think this beautiful image is a wonderful example of the kinds of things we can study and learn with Hubble. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kathy Flanagan up to tell us a little bit about the broader context of the Hubble telescope. The spectacular new Hubble image that we have unveiled is the result of science and engineering community that challenges itself to maximize the productivity of this flagship NASA mission. The crisp and multi-wavelength quality of this remarkable nebula underscores how far we've come since the launch in 1990. Hubble has become the most scientifically prolific telescope of our time, thanks to the courageous astronauts who serviced it and the expertise of Hubble's dedicated technical and scientific support teams. It has been a privilege for the Space Telescope Science Institute to help enable the immense scientific return. In the past quarter century, Hubble has engaged a significant fraction of the worldwide astronomical community, producing nearly 13,000 refereed science papers. In fact, Hubble has inspired and energized a whole new generation of young and diverse astronomers. And the scientific users of Hubble come from everywhere. Anyone with a great scientific idea can get observing time on Hubble, and often we team up with our peers in Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, and South America to identify cutting-edge science that keeps Hubble on the forefront of discovery. NASA, in partnership with the European Space Agency, has given the world this scientific treasure. Hubble's reach goes far beyond the scientific user community. In the 25 years Hubble has been operating, it has indeed become the people's telescope. Hubble images, no known national, political, or ideological boundaries. They are a subtle reminder that we are a common species on a small planet. There are no language or cultural barriers to being awestruck by Hubble images. Hubble's discoveries and images have been transformative for the public's perception of the cosmos. The images have become a cultural icon found on coffee cups, record albums, and even tattoos. Through the Institute's education program, Hubble has excited, engaged, inspired an entire generation of students across the country and around the world. Hubble posters adorn innumerable science classrooms. In fact, tomorrow, the Institute is hosting a coast-to-coast -coast teach in for students from elementary through high school. Students will learn some of Hubble's remarkable scientific achievements and explore some of the most evocative images ever made of the universe. Administrator Bolden will participate in this. 
At our institute, we are also working hard to expand our audience. These two-dimensional images are now being rendered in 3D format. We have, for example, as a companion release, a movie showing a fly-through of how scientifically, realistically, the elements of this image actually come together. In addition, we are working hard to bring our, our images to the visually impaired. We have interactive iBooks now and tactile images and working to prepare 3D printing capability for Hubble images. Our celebration of Hubble's silver anniversary is not really retrospective, however. Hubble is today at the peak of its performance with her most productive years ahead. Hubble will have powerful synergy with a new generation of large ground-based telescopes and the next great NASA astrophysics mission, the James Webb Space Telescope. In fact, the Hubble experience has laid the groundwork for the future of space astronomy. NASA was born to do great things. It is the agency that delivers dreams, enriching the whole world. What amazing wonders await us over the next 25 years and beyond. So before we take a few questions today, we have a very special video that we want to show uh, that's going to show a 3D flyby through the image. John, if you'd like to come up and say a few words about it. Thanks, Amber. Why don't you stay up? When we launched Hubble, we had no idea how amazing the images would be. I mean, truly, people really hadn't thought about it. Uh, when the first images came out, of course, they were spectacular, things like the Eagle Nebula, the Pillars of Creation. And those early images told us how truly beautiful the universe is and rich the fabric of the universe. Well, now we have high-def Hubble images with these new cameras. And combining that high definition, the way our human eyes see, with our scientific knowledge of what these objects actually are like in the universe, we're able to create 3D fly-throughs. And so if we can go ahead and start the, the movie, uh, like the Voyagers in Star Trek, we are now able to fly through, of course, at superluminal speeds, uh, as if in warp drive, actually fly through this nebula. We're going past stars that are in the foreground as we approach the nebula. And hopefully what you'll see in this is that these are not two-dimensional paintings. These are real 3D objects. Uh, and I have to mention at this point that if you want, you can actually print out a little 3D Hubble uh, 25th anniversary telescope. And there's a few in the audience, at least one that we couldn't do. But we're going by these pillars where there's dense dust and new stars are embedded inside. And here we're coming on that cluster of brand new, very bright stars. Uh, so I encourage you all to, uh, to look at this on the web, worldwideweb.nasa.gov. Uh, or hubblesite.org. It's a fantastic thing to look at. There's a much slower version, too, that'll allow you to appreciate it more. Um, but this is you know, one indication of the many thousands and thousands of images that we have on the web of Hubble that you can all appreciate. Sure. Amber? Sure. Awesome. All right, we have time for a few questions. And we do have a mic, so raise your hand, and we'll get the mic to you. My name is Arsenio Menendez, and I'm curious as to what are the mirrors made out of? What are, oh, what are the mirrors made out of? Uh, the mirrors are made out of glass. Uh, Hubble is relatively old technology. It was you know, started in the 1970s and built, uh, the mirror was built by Perkin Elmer. And it's actually a, a very thick piece of glass. It's been lightweighted, and then it took you know, months and months and months to carve the shape and then polish it. Question over there? I think. Uh, hi, my name is Matthew Diazio, and I was wondering, I was talking to people, what are some of the biggest misconceptions people have about the Hubble Space Telescope? Hmm. Ooh. That's very interesting. Misconceptions. 
Well, one, one misconception that I hear sometimes is that people think that the Hubble is actually going to visit places in space. And actually, Hubble is in, in what we call low Earth orbit. It's, it's about, uh, what, 340 miles above the surface of the Earth in orbit. That's why astronauts could access it uh, easily. I know it wasn't easy, but, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, it's there just to get above the atmosphere so we can get sharp images. Uh, um, but really, we are... Uh, receiving light that travels to us from the distant regions of space. So that's one. I think another misconception is that if you were uh, looking out into the universe, if you were above the Earth's atmosphere, even if you were very close to this object, uh, that you would see it as it's shown on the screen. And as Jennifer said, first, well, first of all, Hubble has this amazing light collection, 100 billion times better than the human eyeball. So if you were there, uh, you would see the bright stars, but not very much else. Hubble is able to selectively look at the colors of light that different types of atoms are emitting. And so it's very sensitive in those ranges and able to bring out uh, the, these exquisite details that we wouldn't see. In fact, some of the light, the ultraviolet light and the infrared light, our eyeballs can't see at all. But the other colors are in the range of what human eyes can see. Hi, um, I was just wondering, you've mentioned how Hubble is contributing towards the journey to Mars, uh, the information you're gathering. Could you speak a little bit more to that and tell us maybe some more specifics? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Okay. Uh, could you speak to uh, what kind of information Hubble is contributing towards NASA's goal to get to Mars? Oh, to get to Mars? Um, well, I can speak a little bit. I mean, we are very interested in understanding the science of the solar system. We want to understand how the planets in our solar system formed, including planet Earth and, and Mars. We'd like to know how planets become habitable. You know, there's life on Earth. We don't know if there has ever been life on Mars. We know the climate has changed drastically on Mars. So we're using Hubble to understand both Mars, but, but also the, the, the solar system as a whole. And I think that helps us understand what we would want to learn if we sent humans there and what kind of environment they might encounter. Now, Hubble does uh, regularly image Mars. Now that we have spacecraft at Mars, we have several orbiters, including the recently arrived MAVEN orbiter uh, that's studying the upper atmosphere. But Hubble has observed different types of weather and clouds and surface structures. Um, back a few years ago, a team uh, led by Jim Bell uh, who's now at Arizona State University, did a series of observations of Mars to try and look for signs of methane on Mars. And there have been ground-based observations of methane on Mars, but it was very speculative because in order to look with a ground-based telescope at Mars, you have to look through the Earth's atmosphere, which of course has lots of methane in it. So it's a very tricky observation to do from the ground. Hubble has the advantage it's above the Earth's atmosphere, and so it had a clear unobstructed view. Unfortunately, they didn't really find any signs of it. Uh, we now have the Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars, and when it first arrived, it started looking for methane and didn't see it. And then for a couple of months this year, we saw a sign of methane on Mars, which is one of the indicators of life or some kind of geochemistry. Uh, so we still don't know what the source is, but we now know there's methane on Mars. And so Hubble is part of all of the tools we use to put together the knowledge we need to, to learn about Mars from a science perspective, but also for future explorers. But there's a more fundamental way that I think Hubble is, has contributed uh, to our efforts to send humans to Mars. And in the same way that Hubble contributed to the International Space Station. Virtually every spacewalk that's done on the International Space Station carries tools that were developed for servicing the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, Hubble is really hard to fix and hard to upgrade. And we had to invent new tools and new techniques. And in 1993, when uh, the crew went up to do that first servicing mission in the three years prior to that, they had to invent almost all of the things that we now know about modern spacewalking and space repair that we're using on the International Space Station. And I'm convinced that when we uh, leave our you know, home environment, go out to the proving ground, and then go out to Mars, that those same Hubble tools and techniques will be used. Good morning. My name is John Tulloch. You have talked a little bit about the astronauts who've worked with Hubble and 
how you just, Dr. Grunsfeld talked about the tools that were, were used and created for this, but how has Hubble and the human spaceflight program worked together and how has Hubble benefited the human spaceflight program? I'll, I'll take a shot at it real quickly and it's, you know, Hubble, I, I was privileged to lead the independent review panel for what, was S, what became STS-125 and, and the panel was put together much to the credit of Senator Barbara Mikulski when we talk about Hubble being the people's telescope and, and that is a misconception. Hubble is not a telescope. Hubble is an observatory. It is a rich observatory that today has six instruments that are unprecedented and probably will not be repeated again. So the, the, the richness of Hubble is in the breadth of its ability to see across, across the, the electronic, electromagnetic spectrum. But the things that we had to do to service Hubble um, were, were operations that we would have loved to have been able to do robotically. It is not, these guys have fun when they go out. It is not fun to be a member of a crew inside the spacecraft who has just put somebody in a spacesuit to see your friend go out into the vacuum of space because there are all kinds of really bad things that can happen. So if you want to try to limit the risk to human beings, we need to develop much more robotic technologies than we have today. Hubble was the, was the impetus for that. You know, when, when we convened our study group and the National Research Council looked at how you, how you think about saving Hubble, we went in with the intention of identifying a robotic method to do that. And the technology just wasn't there yet. Today, because of the preparation for Hubble and, and trying to answer that question about technology, we now have robotic capabilities that, were un, that are unheralded and, and unheard of before. So we find from Hubble that, you know, you can send a, you can send a robot out. John, I, I'll go back to landing Curiosity on Mars. The, the night that, that it landed, we had a press conference and John got up to the podium and he said, I have a prediction, bad. Uh, we, <laughs> we should never be predicting stuff. He said, my prediction is, Curiosity will discover nothing. And I fainted almost. And, and, and then he said, the reason it will discover nothing is because it's a robot. And what it does is it sends data down to Earth for human beings to interpret and, and things. Hubble, as incredible as it is, uh, the real Hubble heroes are the people at the Space Telescope Science Institute, at Goddard, all around the world who take the data that Hubble provides for us and interpret it and make it meaningful and make these kinds of images. Because as John said, that's not the way stuff comes down from Hubble. It's <laughs> ones and zeros. And so somebody's got to take it and transform it back into the image that Hubble sees. So um, just uh, Hubble has been the, the, the forefront of getting us to understand how interdependent humans and robots are. Good morning. Um, so these days we get a cell phone and it seems obsolete after a month. So you mentioned earlier that upgrades to Hubble, it's not the, the easiest process to do. So I was curious, you know, it's, it's been 25 years, is there a technology or a scientific process that wasn't included that now you kind of wish it, it was included in the original design? So when Hubble was first launched in 1990, there were lots of things that we would have liked uh, to have in the telescope, but it, it had to be put together over a period of you know, 15 to 18 years of work on the detectors. So even when it was launched, it was known that there was better technology for better detectors, better cameras. Uh, and that was sort of the whole point of building a serviceable telescope, is so it could be upgraded. And so in uh, 1997, the first uh, flight that put in a whole new generation of instruments, they were state-of-the-art instruments. Uh, of course, technology marches on. So in 2009, uh, when we put in the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph uh, and the Wide Field Camera 3, we were putting in state-of-the-art technology. And it's still pretty close to state-of-the-art. Um, the next generation, though, is what we're putting into the James Webb Space Telescope. And in fact, at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, we've just installed the new detectors into the cameras that will be launched in three years, and those detectors are absolutely state-of-the-art today. But even as we're doing that, we're talking about future telescopes and developing technology in partnership with the Space Technology Mission Directorate at NASA and Science. We're putting effort into finding out what are those detectors that in the 2020s we'll be putting into telescopes. Hey, well, ladies and gentlemen, and folks watching us on TV, 
There's nothing wrong with your television. I'm not Amber Strong. I'm Dwayne Brown from the Office of Communications. You know, at NASA, we talk about teamwork, so we're going to team up here, and I'm going to close out for Amber. I want to thank everyone, and I want to thank the museum for this magnificent day as we celebrate 25 years tomorrow, a gift that keeps on giving from the Hubble Space Telescope. This photo, the video, and any other of the incredible images and information uh, available online at www.nasa.gov and the official Hubble 25th anniversary website at www.hubble25th.org. I want to thank everyone. I want to say happy birthday and thank the museum for a wonderful day. Thank you.